This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. From Microbe TV, this is Twim This Week in Microbiology, episode 135. Recorded on September 15th, 2016. This episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,500 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first two months are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash microbe and Use the promo code MICROBE. This episode is also brought to you by Drobo, a family of safe, expandable, and simple-to-use storage arrays. Drobos are designed to protect your important data forever. Visit drobo.com to learn more. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, hello there from sunny California. Yeah, it's always sunny there, right? Indeed. As that song goes, it never rains in sunny well, California. And that's true. Yeah, we wish it were otherwise because we can use it. <laughs> Still dry, huh? Yep. It's too bad. Well, we're imitating you. We've had no rain in two months here. Mm. Not, not even this hurricane that went through didn't give us any rain. Of course, most of the country's produce doesn't come from New Jersey and New York, so it doesn't matter as much, I guess. Also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. How's your football going? Good? 2-0. and oh. Wow. And oddly, we're getting rain on Saturdays, football Saturdays, but not during the week. So that's not good. <laughs> so they play anyway, right? Yeah. Doesn't matter. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Big, big time, right? That'd Thunder. Time. Thunder will close it down, but. Michelle, I was just in... Um, Chapel Hill the past few days visiting UNC. I saw that on Twitter. And Good for you. Lots of blue there. Yeah. They, they even gave me a, a hoodie zip up Carolina t a sweatshirt thingy. Nice. <laughs> I don't have one from Michigan. I never got one when I went there. <laughs> but, um, you know, football is pretty big there as well, right? There is. And, and, and basketball too, right? Basketball yeah. more so. Yeah, do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, it was fun. It's always fun visiting these schools that are really uber dependent on sports because here at Columbia, we are not, as you know. I don't know about dependent. I mean, it's both of our institutions are quite strong yeah, um, yeah. research and educational institutions, but we do love our sports. Well, it brings in, and Palmenberg at Wisconsin said, brings in money that trickles down outside of the sports program. Is that true? It sure does. And actually, Across the country, um, schools will see an increase in applications after their teams have done especially well in March Madness or mm. football. So, is, is that also true if someone wins a Nobel Prize at a university? Do you get increased <laughs> applications? What do you think? Probably, I bet no, but I think someone <laughs> should do the study. It would be interesting, right? It doesn't get nearly the press. I tell they, you, though, at UNC, there is a big billboard on one of the highways, and also as you drive – uh, into the medical center area. It stretches across the w road and it says, congratulations to our Nobel laureates. And one of, oh, them, that's great. one of them was Oliver Smithies. And I don't remember yeah. the other one. They have photos of them up there. That's kind of good, right? It's wonderful. Like and that. Berkeley, I recall, they have parking places, um, permanent parking places for their Nobel laureates. That is a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> and it's primo real estate. Now you're talking. Also joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hey, Vincent. Sorry Hello, to, everyone. Sorry to take so long to bring you no, in. It's okay. <laughs> I always understand about sports. Um, Charleston. How's Charleston? Good? We, we have uh, the remnants of Tropical Depression, Julia, that Julia. dropped four inches of rain on us yesterday after the Harry Potter hurricane. Hermione came through and dropped a... The last time we had twim dropped another four inches of rain. You didn't have any so damage we've, or anything, right? To you, or your no, lab. we just, why, we just is it, had rain. why is it called Harry Potter? Because of Hermione, because oh. Hermione was a ah. character in Harry Potter. Okay. So, Michael, I was in uh, Chapel Hill for a couple of days, extra on on top of my seminar and twiv. I wanted to see 
if I think about living there one day, right? I want to I want a small college town to set up a podcasting company, you know, where there'd be faculty who would be interested in coming to the studio and recording. And uh, they, you know, it's the winter is not so warm there in Chapel Hill. So they said you should check out Charleston. We we have uh, much the warmer. College of Charleston, which has um, a comprehensive uh, liberal science based education. So the question uh, there's is, a, Michael, is it warmer in the winter than than Chapel? It Hill? It is. <laughs> we are indeed warmer than Chapel Hill. I remember uh, last New Year's Day; it was seventy degrees and sunny. And wow, now that's warm. Yeah, that was warm. And you never and get you never get snow, right? We've had snow in the twenty seven years I've lived here three times. Anyway, Michael, the bottom line is we're going to come visit Charleston at some point well, in the next year or so. so. The we'll food to is see fantastic. It. And we, I don't know, Ann Arbor is too cold. I, I wouldn't even think about it. Same with Wisconsin, Madison, you know, got to go south. Well, you know, our the old, summers are very pleasant. They are very pleasant. Yeah. Our old twimster, Margaret McFall Nye, went defected to Hawaii from she Madison. She did. I heard that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Are we going to talk about the weather the rest of the time? Hey. <laughs> oh, no. I knew that was We're coming. talking about me, my future place of living, you know, where it's oh, That's very interesting. You went to San Diego because it's warm in part and I'm No, I didn't. I'm thinking <laughs> you want to escape the northeast. No, I didn't. Okay. I'm just joking. I don't actually know why you went, but it's okay. Personal right. reasons. Personal reasons. All right, so, so la femme. Cherchez la femme. Got it. <laughs> All right. Uh, we got some science for you. We, we figure you do want to hear what scientists think about when they're not thinking about science. And I'm thinking about where to, to do podcasting for the next 20 years. I'm thinking about lunch. All right. We'll let you go to lunch. <laughs> give, give us an hour. Are you hungry, Elio? I'm fine. I'm kidding you. All right. We have a snippet in a paper. I'm going to do a snippet for everyone. This is a paper that was just published in M-Sphere, which is the relative, one of the relatively new ASM journals, open access, you know, from day one, you can, everyone can go and get the paper. So mm -hmm. M-Sphere and this paper is called Extreme Dysbiosis of the Microbiome in Critical Illness. And the uh, first author is Daniel McDonald. Uh, the senior or the last author is Paul Wishmeyer, and the second to last author is Rob Knight, well known, I think, to many of our listeners as the person who wants to sequence the earth. At least that's what he said on multiple occasions. He was on TWIM, I don't know, a couple of years ago. He, he came here to visit Columbia, and I did a one on one TWIM with Rob Knight, and he's been all over the press, of course, TED Talks, and so forth. And this paper, what the work here done in uh, uh, University of California, San Diego, University of Colorado in Denver, Queens University in Ontario, Canada, University of Maryland, a clinic, Cox Health in Missouri, and uh, another health center in Ontario, Canada. And uh, this has all to do with the microbiome, which we talk about a lot. You know, many people believe that. Um, there is a good microbiome and a bad one, and a good one promotes general good health. An altered one, which we call dysbiosis, involves overgrowth of pathogenic bacteria. And, you know, we think that a dysbiosis is associated with uh, a lot of uh, abnormal health, but we, we don't know if it's causative or con a consequence of it in many cases. So the, the purpose of this study was to look in people with extreme dysbiosis, that is, people who are admitted to an intensive care unit. There's been some, well, first of all, over 5 million people a year in the U.S. are admitted every year to intensive care units. These admissions take up about 20% of the hospital costs in the U.S. And, you know, deaths from critical illnesses are increasing at a higher rate than any other cause of death worldwide. And previously, very small culture-based studies where they isolate bacteria by traditional methods from these individuals in ICUs have suggested that they, the people who are admitted to the ICU in general have dysbiosis. Their microbiomes are altered and uh, the commensals are lost and you have an overgrowth of potentially bad bacteria, pathogenic bacteria. And this 
dysbiosis is thought to lead to hospital-acquired infections, sepsis, you know, bacteria in the blood, uh, multi-organ failure. And so there's obviously a need to figure out if the, the dysbiosis is a consequence of the illness, the severe illness of these people, or if it's a cause of it. Um, Michael, I wanted to, and Michelle perhaps as well, but Michael, since you're kind of the more thinking about medical issues, what would lead, what are some of the things that would lead to someone being admitted to an ICU? Oh, they're long. There's many reasons, everything from automobile accidents to uh, cardiac incidents mm -hmm. to uh, just being your immune system is breaking down and the barriers between your gut and your sterile body cavities are breaking down and the bacteria are just weeping in. Mm -hmm. So, Or like a burst appendix. That would be an a, acute event. A okay. burst appendix burst appendix. How, but about, how about a stroke? Would that get you in an ICU? That gets you in the stroke center, stroke center and, they, okay. and they typically pump you up with either thrombolytics or not, depending on what type of stroke you may be having. Okay. So a wide mm -hmm. variety of, of very serious conditions then, right? Yeah. Now in, in this, in this study, they looked at 115 ICU patients. They were all 18 years of age or older. They were mechanically ventilated within 48 hours of admission, and they were expected to remain longer than 72 hours in the ICU. And they were at five different locations in the U.S. and Canada, and those uh, health care uh, centers that I mentioned, one in Maryland and uh, one in Ontario, those are obviously part of that study. But we don't know why these individuals were admitted. And, and just to be clear, they were mechanically ventilated as part of their treatment. That was not part of this study design. Right. That right. Would, that would be okay. some. They didn't, they didn't volunteer for it. Wow, yeah. Right. That, would probably that was be one a, of the criteria for inclusion in the study. Right. And then they took uh, samples um, from these patients from, um, well, first they took samples at admission, uh, and then they took samples uh, after they were discharged. So we have two different samples taken, multiple samples. They had skin samples and fecal, oral, and skin sample collection by hospital personnel. Just in, in terms of a clinical study, this is, I don't know how you would do this. Obviously, it's possible because it was done, but most clinical studies, you get approval of the person. They sign an agreement. But some of these people must have come in in very serious conditions and maybe in no condition to give any approval to do anything. So I don't know how that would work. It's quite interesting. But that's an it, aside, right? Yes, it, it, it really was. And one of the things that I was hoping to see in this paper is something like an Apa the average Apache score, which is a metric that uh, the critical care community uses to mm. score how ill a patient is to effectively give us an idea about the homogeneity of the patient population of how sick they were right. and the Apache score stands for acute physiology and chronic health evaluation and mechanically ventilated tells us one thing. The other thing that was missing from the body of the paper is what fraction of the population was on antibiotics right. during the study In the study that we did in our ICU uh, over half of our patients were on antibiotics when we conducted our study. So I was wondering if it was a similar metric, but it all comes out in the wash, so to speak, because they were comparing everybody to everybody. Yeah, I mean, that's important, obviously, because uh, taking antibiotics would alter the microbiome. and We know that causes dysbiosis. Yeah, so that isn't given, and uh, I think that's an important part. And in fact, they say that there have been previously smaller studies uh, on ICU patients, and um, they say part of the problem with those studies is we don't know who are, who are on antibiotics or not, but they don't do that here either. So, yeah, know, but I, to their credit, they raise that as a um, exactly. a limitation of it their study. Be, yeah, exactly, exactly. Now, the, so what they did is they took these samples, they sequence sixteen S ribosomal RNA to say what bacteria are present in these uh, samples that I just mentioned, and one of the things they did. In this study, which they say is unique, is they asked whether, so that you could tell what the composition of the microbiome is by standard techniques, but they also said 
how does this differ from the expected compositions of the microbiome? And there's enough data out there that you can start to do that. There's the American Gut Project, which has people, you know, you can go to a website and I think pay some a little bit of money and have your fecal microbiome sequence. So all that data goes into a database and they can say, how do these patients' compositions differ from the, the air? There's also another uh, database called Kita, K-Q-I-I-T-A, where they get uh, a number of samples um, and they're all submitted online from different studies. These include uh, healthy individuals, healthy children, dust from <laughs> built environment, skin from decomposing human bodies, the soil around decomposing human bodies. So they can say, how different are these ICU patients from all of these? And the bottom line is, no matter why these individuals were admitted, so they know why they were admitted, but we don't, microbiome is typically drawn from unexpected sources. For example, their fecal microbiome doesn't resemble your typical fecal microbiome. Their microbial communities are substantially disrupted and more so later in your stay in the ICU. And so they say, you know, we have to look more at the microbiome in these critical care patients. So, um, you know, this brings up my a hobby horse of mine yep. that uh, if you want to make establish some causality between this and health and disease, looking at the feces may or may not be the right thing to do yeah. because the feces do not necessarily reflect what goes on in the upper reaches of the colon. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite different there. And of course, the problem is that sampling that is a bear. It's almost, we don't have really a good way to do it. That's right. Uh, ostomies don't really count because they are abnormal situations. And, you know, there's, there's not a lot you can do about it. But I'm saying in the future, somebody's going to come up with a capsule that you can swallow and which can be programmed to take samples whatever you want to. And when that happens, a lot of this will have to be rewritten. Yeah, although those, the, the capsule is a great idea, but it's going to has to be, have to be able to take, you know, samples from close, right on the, uh, the colon, right. wall, the intestinal and different, wall. Different right? parts yeah, of, you know, sure. different layers, the, the, um, the, the proximate layer to the epithelium, then the mucus yeah. layer and whatever else there is, the crypts. You know, it, 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 it takes a sophisticated engineering study and that has probably is in the works. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, of course, of course. Now, one of the things I just thought of is that these, when, on admission, of course, they were sample, the first sample was taken within 72 hours of, of admission, I believe. But for many of them, maybe if it were at admission, maybe they didn't already have antibiotics. And so, mm -hmm. but yet they're all already, their microbiomes were already disturbed. Um, mm -hmm. upon admission. So that could be a consequence of their illness or a cause, of course, we don't know. But at least some of them, the antibiotic treatment uh, may have not been an initial disturbance. But later on, it gets worse when they're, when they're released. So it could be that's also a consequence of antibiotic treatment. So, so I think you're, lo you're re looking at figure two, I think. Yeah, um, yeah. They have three panels there, and it's very nicely color-coded, so they've collapsed a ton of data into a way that you can just visually grasp it pretty, pretty quickly. Yeah. But there is, as you pointed out, a larger difference between healthy and the admit, admitted patients than there is between the admission and the discharge. That's right. That's right. It's the way I look at the data. That's right. Mm. Yeah, and if you want to look at the paper, the, the – the data is nicely presented in a visual way that you can really see the differences. You know, each patient, for example, is a dot on some of these plots. And you can see very quickly how the ICU patients differ at each of these locations from the, uh, you know, the normal people that they used for their, their comparison. Just a couple more. Oh, it's um, very dramatic. Really. Yeah, very nice. A few more things. They say many of the samples are unexpected composition because they compare the ICU patients to the database. For example, one adult fe fecal sample resembled the microbiome of a decomposing corpse, <laughs> which is really <laughs> unexpected. Um, and as um, and probably not a good sign. Not a good sign, and how that occurs <laughs> is really not understood. And as um, as Michelle said, the fecal and oral samples at admission were were more similar to each other than obtained at discharge. So staying in an ICU uh, further disrupts your your microbial uh, community. Just a couple of words on what 
sorts of uh, bacteria. They characterize the samples at the phylum level, and the fecal samples from the ICU patients tended to have less abundant firmicutes and bacteroidetes, and an increased abundance of proteobacteria. They also saw large depletions of organisms that are thought to have some kind of anti-inflammatory benefits like the fecalibacterium. Known pathogens like enterobacters and staphylococci go up the hmm. taxa in these patients. And so you see that uh, there is a, a disruption in all of these individuals in these ways. Now, one interesting thing that they observed, they, they, these taxons with inflammatory bacteria tend to uh, co-occur in these patients. So, for example, enterobacteriaceae, including Salmonella, enterobacter, et cetera, they, they co-occur, they, they go up together. And this is true at both time points. And they say a very interesting analogy. They say this is analogous to an unruly person looting vulnerable shops after a disaster as unruly <laughs> individuals tend to bring their unruly friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. That's, that's the perfect Beautiful. analogy. Unruly bacteria bring their unruly friends uh, with them. Where they independently, unruly people, unruly people independently flock to those disrupted sites. Right, right. Because <laughs> they thrive there. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's essentially the study. It's a rather short paper. It's perfect for a snippet. So you see ICU patients in this study, 115 of them severely dysbiotic. And whether, you know, that caused or is a consequence of their illness uh, remains to be determined. But it clearly shows, and these people were probably all admitted for different reasons, that uh, it really is uh, severe illness is bad for you in, in, in many ways. I was fascinated by the American Gut Project that they used as their baseline. Yeah. So I, I mm. did a Google search and found this is a, a citizen science project that mm -hmm. Rob Knight is um, leading. They have a, a partner project in Britain, so people in the UK and Europe can participate. But basically, they're calling for individuals to send, at a minimum, 99 bucks. You get a kit then where you can take swabs from your skin, your mouth, or give a fecal sample. You send it back to them on ice, and then um, you'll get some data. And they'll, they're sharing the data, so they, they're billing this as citizen science, open mm -hmm. access, crowdsourcing, uh, you name it, all those buzzwords to try to build a huge database. Um, and you also fill out, of course, um, a questionnaire about your eating habits, et cetera, your health um, that they'll build into this huge data set. Yeah, it's cool. I should do it's it. really ambitious. Yeah. Would you do it, Michelle? You know, I thought about doing it while I was um, while I was doing this work. But, yeah, I have colleagues here at Michigan that might be able to help me out, too. <laughs> yeah, it's true. They could do it for free. <laughs> Mm. Well, if you go to this American Gut site, you can watch movies of Rob Knight. You know, he's explaining it, but he also shows how to swab. Which is very important. That's right. And send back the samples properly. Yeah, this is very cool. This is something uh, I've known about for a while, and I think it's great. You can also uh, you can also do that for your genome as well. It's much more expensive, though. We yeah. also have special deals, like if you and your partner <laughs> want to do it together, or you and your dog, or you and your family, you know, then, then there are different prices for those different groups. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, but I'd I like think, to do it. I think that's fun. Yeah. It, it, the, neat thing, the neat thing is that it, it really is making the microbiome approachable to the average person who may or may not be interested in it. You, you begin to see how they – you can participate and it's it's really a very very cool yeah project right one of the things that i would like to encourage the hospital community to do is when you're discharged if you're recording if the hospital was recording as part of their normal surveillance program whether or not you're colonized with um, one of the antibiotic resistant microbes like MRSA VRE or now the carbapenemase resistant Enterobacteriaceae. Many hospitals have a universal surveillance program for these microbes, and that okay. would have been that would have been nice to overlay. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Most hospitals will screen patients upon admission 
whether or not they're colonized with MRSA, VRE, and now Cree, because once those What's organisms, Spell it carbapenem, out. carbapenemase resistant Enterobacteriaceae, which right. is part of those big group of uh, NDM or KPC. KPC is carbapenemase resistant uh, Klebsiella pneumoniae. The K and the P stand for Klebsiella pneumoniae, and the C is carbapenemase. And the CDC is is looking at all of these things. But those are sort of the data that you want to drop on to this when you're trying to reduce the significance. And so I think as as first studies in this journal Msphere, it really was very instructive to see how they were approaching the problem and the scale. And I think as Michelle brought up, this these other crowdsourced based programs are are really pretty neat. And once you're discharged, if you wanna send your your fecal sample or your skin sample back after you've gotten quote better. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, that would be it, nice. It, it would be really neat to see, do the follow-up. And that's often the most difficult and most challenging with clinical trials is follow-up once the individual becomes better. Yeah, because we would assume if you go back into your home, eventually your microbiome will return to its pre-illness state, right? It would be interesting to see if that happens or if they're... You, if it's irreversible. If you're, if you're, you follow someone through the rest of their life, they get ill again, does it change? It would be really interesting. Well, there's also data showing that if you bring MRSA home, Mm-hmm. Over the next months and years, you're going to share it with your Absolutely. whoever you live with. Yeah. So, including but, your pets, including yeah. your pets. So, I share your excitement for the citizens science project and microbiome research, but we shouldn't oversell it. I think if we got the profile back of our own fecal microbiome, there's not a lot we could know for sure. Right. Uh, just right. based on the 16s and the and the genus level. Yeah. Although community. as part of a big database, it's useful to others, right? Right, right, right. We'd be giving more than um, we'd be getting, getting back, back at yeah. this point. But, you know, two years, five years from now, I think um, it's going to be really interesting. Or to follow yourself longitudinally yes. if you decide yes. you're going to change your diet to a you know low-fat, high-plant diet. Or if you travel, go somewhere for right. a long period, you could see how it changes. Or if you'd like to know if you and your dog share a microbiome, you know, that could excite right. some people. I could see that. Thinking more about these ICU disruptions, um, is there already a practice in place where if you have elective surgery, can you donate and store your fecal material and then have it re-transplanted to help restore the Mm. healthy community? Yeah, I don't know. Do you know, know, Michael? Autologous fecal transplant. It varies from, 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 from. Michael, you left. All right, let me uh, give him a few minutes here to. You may have had to reboot. Let me, in the meanwhile, tell you about a sponsor of this episode, Curiosity Stream, the world's first ad-free nonfiction streaming service. They have over 1,500 titles, 600 hours of content, and it was founded by John Hendricks of Discovery Channel, where you know you can get real science shows, not reality TV. You can get it on many platforms, including the web and many devices like Roku, Android, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, and Kindle, Apple TV. It's available in 196 countries all over the world. And what they have, which listeners of TWIM might be interested in, is a wide variety of science and technology content. They also have nature, history, and many other topics. Interviews, for example, interviews and lectures. They have Stephen Hawking's Universe, a series where he traces the history of astronomical theories and technology. They have Deep Time History, a three part original that tells the story of the 14 billion year history of the universe and underwater wonders of the national parks. This is the hundredth anniversary this year of the founding of the U S national parks. And this is a seven part series that'll take you under the bodies of water within the national parks. Here's Michael. Hello, Michael. I could hear every word you were saying. It's frustrating, isn't it? (laughs) All right. I'm in the middle of an ad. Let me finish it. Okay. And, uh, then you were about to say something. They have uh, one of the largest nonfiction 4K libraries on the internet. They have over 50 hours of so-called super high definition 4K content, and all of this is available with monthly or annual plans. And they start at just 2.99 a month, less than a cup of coffee or a 
cost of a single title on some of the competing platforms. Check out curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe during sign up and you will get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series completely free for the first 60 days. That's two months free of one of the largest nonfiction 4K libraries around. Just go to curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the offer code microbe when you sign up. We thank Curiosity Stream for their support of TWIM. And Michael, uh, remember, Michelle had just asked you if there are any programs where if you're going in for surgery, you could save your fecal microbiome and then take it at the other end. Is and what we, You were about to talk and then you disconnected. It was the <laughs> brave new world of biobanking. Some hospitals with active uh, fecal transplant programs are setting up biobanking, and it really is uh, a, an emerging science and clinical discipline that is uh, spreading across the country, and hospitals are setting up protocols. I know our own hospital is is actively looking into setting up a biobanking slash stool transplant, fecal transplant uh, program because of the effectiveness of um, the clinical aspects of, of those activities. Okay. All right. Now we have a paper. Michael, what do you have for us? I have a paper from the Journal of Applied and Environmental Microbiology, and it's entitled Vancomycin Resistant Enterococci and Bacterial Community Structure Following a Sewage Spill into an Aquatic Environment. The paper is by Suzanne Young, Bina Navak, Sean Sun, Brian Bagley, Jason Rohr, and Valerie Hardwood. And they're from the Department of Integrative Biology at the University of South Florida in Tampa and the Department of Soil and Environmental Sciences from Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia. So I stumbled into this paper as I was helping my new graduate student begin to look at her project of trying to understand this whole issue of antibiotic-resistant microbes in the built environment of our hospital. And so as I was going through the journals and looking at the titles, I came across Dr. Harwood and her colleagues' paper. And VRE is, is a plague in modern U.S. hospitals. It's one of those organisms for which there is a universal surveillance program. Uh, every patient that enters our hospital uh, within 24 hour, or within yeah, within 24 hours, they are actually screened as to whether or not they're carrying VRE. So, as you can mm. well imagine, uh, when there's a sewage spill into an aquatic environment, of uh, vancomycin and, and the sewage actually has vancomycin resistant microbes in it, principally the enterococci. Of course, folks are very much concerned about moving this into moving this resistance trait into the animal community and putting it out into the environment because then it will just spread this antibiotic resistance trait. So I was really interested in how Carrie and her colleagues were going to actually characterize how long these things can persist after a spill. And if you think about it, this is what happens in our hospitals all the time. People have diarrhea. They may have a fugitive emission where they have an accident trying to get to the toilet. And you're effectively releasing antibiotic-resistant microbes into the built environment. So I was very curious how one could monitor this on a, a much larger scale. And, of course, as the introduction of this paper so eloquently states they talk about sewage spills releasing antibiotic resistance bacteria into surface waters contributing to this global environmental reservoir and we all appreciate that the microbes are exchanging information they're trading how they can survive in this germ warfare that we're effectively waging against them by using antibiotics and uh it was a really fascinating read of, of seeing how they were able to characterize the presence of, of VRE and the, from this particular spill. Vancomycin-resistant enterococci are nosocomial pathogens. You typically will acquire it in a hospital if you haven't already 
come in with it. And they've been detected in environmental habitats, including soil, water, and even beach sands, as well as um, wildlife uh, feces. But the thing that we're most concerned about is this one particular gene, Van A. And Van A confers high level of resistance to vancomycin. And vancomycin was considered the antibiotic of last resort against gram positives, especially the staphylococci, particularly methicillin-resistant staphylococci, which is a really bad actor uh, in hospitals. And it, it kills quite a few of those ICU patients that we were talking about in that last snippet. And so this study found uh, culturable Enterococcus fecium harboring the Van A gene in water and sediment for up to three days after a sewage spill. And then they use quantitative PCR to ask whether or not the Van A gene would persist in both water and sediment for uh, up to, and they had a specific time course that we'll take you through when we get to the data. And I selected this paper for the last statement in, in its aspect and its abstract. The spread of opportunistic pathogens harboring high-level vancomycin resistance genes beyond hospitals and into the broader community and associated habitats is a potential potential threat to public health, requiring further studies that examine the persistence, occurrence, and survival of VRE in different environmental matrices. And so we look at their, their first figure. And they, we had this sewage spill, and we simply at, they asked the question whether or not they could find culturable enterococci in water and sediment at this one particular site, NC03. And in their supplemental materials, they actually show you a beautiful map of South Florida near the Tampa Bay region that actually shows where the spill actually occurred. There was a sewage pipe that broke, right? It was a sewage pipe that broke. And, and just, to, just to emphasize, this was not a small spill. They <laughs> estimated 500,000 gallons of untreated sewage were released into this neighborhood draining ditch. I'm glad you brought that up because now I don't have to. That's where yeah. I was just getting that's to. A lot of, yeah. and that's a lot of sewage. And the thing folks. is, this is going to happen again and again because pipes break, right? Well, our, our infrastructure in the United States is aging. You yep, have to yep. remember that the Clean Water Act, which funded a lot of our sewage treatment infrastructure, was funded at the end of the 60s. And, you know, we're approaching 50 years old on these things, and a lot of the pipes weren't designed yep, yep. to go beyond 50 years. And, you know, we're having growth, and we're pumping a lot of sewage through. So it, it really is significant. And the concentrations of the enterococci that they found in 100 mils of water were well above the EPA standard for recreational waters, which is 130 bacteria per 100 milliliters. Now, mm. why is that number 130 significant? Well, the EPA has done studies, and it's all based on risk. What's the risk if you happen to encounter that water? And typically we encounter waters as we either go to the beach and go swimming, but you could encounter this water as part of your everyday occurrence if you stumble into the spill. And the estimated rate of illness once it goes above 130 is 36 individuals mm -hmm. out of 1,000 mm -hmm. will become sick. And you know what kind of sickness you get associated with enterococci. It's, you know, diarrhea. And so consequently, you see at, at 4,200 per 100 mils, that's well above the EPA standard. And it's, it's pretty significant considering that when they asked the question whether or not it carried the drug resistance trait of vancomycin, the answer was yes, indeed it did. And they tracked it over time, 
starting on the 1st of October and they moved out all the way out until the 21st of November of 2014. And they asked the question about whether or not they could find this resistance trait in water and sediment. And they found, yes, indeed, the, the, the microbes were indeed there. They didn't drop below this magic threshold in the water until the sample that they collected on Halloween or the 30th. <laughs> so we're talking a month, folks. How far and, away from the spill were they sampling? Uh, it depends. It's, uh, it depends on the uh, – they had a number of samples, but typically uh, the Van A gene was detected within 800 meters of the spill. So 800 mm. meters is a good distance. Mm. So the microbes are indeed moving. In addition – they also monitored for enterococci in Pinellas County at eight surface water sites from one to nine kilometers away from the spill for 12 consecutive days following this massive spill. And four sites within four and a half kilometers displayed enterococcal levels that exceeded mm. recreational water quality standards of that magic 130 for some duration after the spill. They did the, the standard uh, quantitative PCR for looking for the Van A gene, and they take us through telling us about uh, how microbes can become resistant to vancomycin. And rather than going into the digression of how uh, vancomycin um, works in bacteria, recognize that it just inhibits uh, peptidoglycan synthesis and the Van A uh, is usually carried on a plasmid borne transposon. So, what they were looking at in copy number, generally, if the transposon is in there and it's plasmid borne, they're looking for it. And the number of genes is probably equivalent to um, the number of bacteria that are possessing the gene because I think. Um, the plasmid-borne transmission transposons in these enterococci, I think they're generally big plasmids and not the common multi-copy plasmid that we routinely use in the lab where there can be typically 100 uh, copies of a plasmid per cell. I think this is one of those big plasmids, but I didn't have an opportunity to ground truth whether TN1546 was indeed a big or small plasmid. Michelle, do you know? I don't, but it's definitely worth emphasizing that um, because it's on a transposon and a plasmid, that means it can more easily move from one bacterium to another, from one species to another. Yeah. So that's r the real risk here when you're thinking about this Van A gene on a transposon out in the environment, in, in this neighborhood. Michael, did they look uh, to see if any animals had picked up the, uh, uh, the plasmid or the bacterium? I don't recall if they looked for fecal samples of that. I don't recall reading about that, and yeah. I don't recall seeing it in the supplement. Okay. Yeah, also, I think they, they focused on water and sediment samples. Yeah. Also, Michael, would you – it would be interesting to see if there were any increase in these infections in the area, you know, coincident with this. Right? And that wasn't reported on in the paper as well. Yeah. Okay. But – that then takes me to the, the, the coolest thing that I found in this paper, and that was their um, second figure. And the second figure I found really cool because they were using a technique called non-metric multidimensional scaling. And Dr. Harwood's lab, uh, Carrie is a microbial ecologist. This is Jody. This is Jody oh, Harwood. Jody. That's right. <laughs> I, I get the, I get them confused. Thank you, yep. Jody. Uh, and decide. she worked with with the um, bioinformatics specialist um, Jason Rohr, the um, other the, the other senior in this study. Yeah. yeah. So in ecological research, uh, folks are often interested in asking: Have changes occurred? in the composition of a community or one community to the next. And so this non-metric multidimensional scaling is an easy way to collapse information from multiple dimensions. And a dimension is nothing more than a different data set. 
so they can be easily visualized and interpreted. So in figure two, they, they show you the sediment, and the sediment is red on their scale, and then they show you the water, which is blue on their particular figure. So you can immediately tell the sediment data set from the water data set just by looking at the at the the two colors and then the intensity of the color is a function of the are immediately after the spill so the darker the shade it's immediately after the spill and and or earlier in time and so as you move out on this particular figure you see things get dimmer and that's showing you that the community is indeed changing from one location to the another. And this MDS procedure was a really easy way to track whether or not the community was changing or to simply a- answer the question, is the VRE leaving um, the environment? They also uh, did, Michael, excuse me yes, a second. Alien. Is this something like uh, principal component analysis? Or is you can actually different? throw principal component analysis into this as one of your uh, dimensions. So uh-huh. you can actually incorporate uh, the principal component analysis from the sequencing into this. And this is done in a program called R. And a lot of the microbial ecologists that I have encountered have been using R. Vincent and I have a, a mutual friend, Chris Kellogg, who is the strongest proponent of using R. And, and Chris is another one of these microbial ecologists who is always looking at communities. Chris works on coral and uh, Jody is working on this, this particular sewage spill. But they're able to make sense and answer the question – has this thing changed, and is it it going away? The so other it's th- essentially a statistical test that you apply to data sets and allow you to look at their relatedness. Yes, they also um, ask the the simple question, like we were doing in our last paper, as who's there, and they sequence it, and they found six bacterial families to be highly prevalent in domestic sewage, and and they did this principally via 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing. And they looked at the relative abundance of select sewage um, operational taxonomic units looking at the Bacteroideaceae, the Ruminococciaceae, the, the Lactospiraceae, the Porphyrmoniaceae, the Violinellaaceae, and the Prevotellaaceae at this site. And what they saw is – you know, the relative abundance changed with time and it was going back to a more, if you will, back to what it was prior to the spill. And so looking at all of this, you can actually understand that these microbes, even after the spill has occurred and you think the water has dissolved into the ground, the antibiotics resistance trait is still present and representing a risk. And as Michelle brought up, because it's on this transposon, it's able to interact with other microbes. And panibacillus is another gram positive that can actually pick up the vancomycin resistance. And of course, you have to worry about these potentially pathogenic antibiotic resistant bacteria and their associated antibiotic resistant genes moving into the environment, uh, then moving into animals like Vincent brought up, which can really lead to all sorts of bad things happen. You know, Michael, it's kind of ironic. It used to be in the U.S. and many other countries that, you know, sewage was on the streets and we learned to have toilets and put the sewage centrally. But now we have another problem is that the pipes break, right? The pipes break. <laughs> so what do you do? I mean, clearly this paper shows the, the potential dangers, but we're not going to prevent the pipes from breaking, right? Because as you said, the, the infrastructure is old. The infrastructure is old, and we're because we have antibiotics in our food supply, we're being constantly exposed to antibiotics. Mm-hmm. And for the most part, the sewage treatment plant does a bang-up job. Yeah. 
eliminating it because remember, antibiotics add selective pressure and that's why they're disappearing in this sediment. It's because there's no selective pressure to maintain the antibiotic resistance trait. And the reason well, I there's was... Also, there's also a big dilution effect. Um, yeah, too. During, mm-hmm. during, after mm-hmm. a big spill, of course, there's a huge remediation effort, including a lot of flushing. Yep. So... Yep. Yeah. No pun intended. Yeah, it's complicated to do the <laughs> to do the math. Yes, that's right. They me- they mentioned that it was extensively flushed and decontaminated right. and yet, you know, they It still, persisted. persisted. Yet yeah. it persisted for up to 2 weeks. Amazing. And, mm-hmm. Yeah. At least the DNA did. Yeah. The the DNA did. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the main concern here, right? Yep. Yes. Yep, yep. It's a great story. I like it. I uh, I was able to talk with Suzanne Young, who is the graduate student who led this project, and we just we had a great conversation. I am um, tickled pink to say that she was born in Ann Arbor. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> her parents um, both graduated from the medical school here, and her grandparents also both graduated from um, our medical school. Um, her grandparents, Ron and Nancy Bishop, graduated in 1944. Ron then joined the faculty and was on the faculty in internal medicine for 36 years. And he also directed a unit for human values. And in recognition of their work, both Ron and Nancy Bishop's work on for social justice, um, they've been honored by a lecture in bioethics um, that is given here each year at the medical school. So wow. with that as a background, nice. Suzanne was interested in science and in kind of social activism. She credits her parents who um, themselves were very uh, concerned about the environment and real advocates for the environment. She started her formal college training at Columbia, but after a year was just feeling restless um, from the class room work and decided that she wanted to do something more hands-on. She actually took a year off and went to Kenya and worked on a project um, in in collaboration with a program from um, Indiana University where she was working in the pediatric ward of hospitals on a project related to HIV. She then returned to Columbia and got um, a degree in environmental policy. But while she was there, she was working on environmental microbiology. In particular, um, she got involved with a nonprofit organization called Riverkeeper um, in New York City, uh, which you may know of, uh, Vincent. They are um, watchdogs of the Hudson River. They've been defending it for more than 50 years. She was able to work with a um, professor who later convinced her to come and get a master's degree working with him. That was in geological and environmental sciences at Queens College. And her master's project was um, dealt with antibiotic resistance and its prevalence and appearance in the Hudson River. So she's got a long interest in this. She then decided to work for a couple of years with a the Natural Resources Defense Council. So again, this is a nonprofit that d- did a lot of litigation um, to enforce the Clean Water Act. So again, she got a really great hands-on experience with policy. She realized during that time that she wanted to um, be able to drive the knowledge which is used um, to underlie policy decisions about our environment. So she then went to the University of South Florida and joined um, the lab of Jason Rohr, and then her co-advisor is um, Jody Harwood. So she described when this catastrophe happened in in South Florida, which was only about 40 minutes from their campus, um, she and Jody acted quickly to mobilize and get out there and take advantage of this disaster as an experiment to, to learn what is the risk of antibiotic-resistant microbes getting into our water supply. So she described oh, yeah. um, having to drive around these neighborhoods and try to find a site where she could reliably collect samples over periods, a period of a couple of months. It was a real challenge because every day she came, there were construction crews, city workers, people leading the remediation effort. So her access to sites was was, um, challenging, but she found the people in the neighborhood were quite interested and supportive. So over this two-month period, she would go out with her rubber boots and rubber gloves. She'd have a cooler filled with ice and two-liter bottles, and then 
50 mil tubes to collect our samples of water and sediment and then hustle it back to the lab and within six hours process it to um, purify the DNA and uh, freeze those samples so they could later then do the um, DNA analysis. Her work has attracted a lot of attention from the media, both while she was a a master's student working on the Hudson River and also with this project. Of course, people are aware of the risk of antibiotic resistance, and so the press has been um, very interested in her studies. So she, early in her career, is getting quite a lot of experience uh, of handling um, the media and, and being very careful in her language so that she conveys accurate science and tries to do her best to make sure that the the media is not um, hyping the story into a realm that's just not not accurate. So so she's found that to be really um, challenging, but also satisfying in that she can take her knowledge and apply it um, to the public good. So she's hoping in her future career to um, continue melding research and public policy and has appreciated the freedom that uh, faculty have at, at research institutions to identify questions that they think are important and to go out and do the research that can um, contribute to the greater good. She also was grateful for her collaboration with the colleagues from Virginia Tech. So I misspoke earlier. It was um, Brian Badgley and Sean Sun who did the bioinformatic analysis that they needed to understand what um, genuses were in the environment after this spill. So it, it's just been a, a great experience at um, South Florida with Jason Rohr and Jody Harwood. Lovely. Wow. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you, Michael, for the paper. And how about that? How about that relation to, to Michigan? I had no idea. Yeah. I, w- I want to cool. know if the Alumni Association from Michigan is going to send her a t shirt. <laughs> that would be nice, wouldn't it? I don't know, but I think I will send well, the, um, the podcast link the to bioethics the- yeah, unit on campus here, the URL for the podcast. Nice. This episode is also sponsored by Drobo. They make storage devices for your computer to, uh, Store your data, and they solve two problems that affect hard disks. They get full, and they fail because they're mechanical. They will fail. Your hard drive will stop working, and you'll lose data unless you have it backed up. Drobo solves these problems by being expandable. They use a Beyond RAID technology where you can take multiple single hard drives in their devices, and they're fused into a single storage unit that has many advantages over traditional RAIDs. One of them is that you can use different size hard drives and you can add drives on the fly with the power running. The Drobo will tell you how much capacity is being used to store your data. It it does this by simple lights. When the lights are green for each drive, it means there's plenty of space on them. As, As they turn yellow, there is less space and you should start thinking about getting another drive or a bigger one. And if it's red, there's no more room. So if you have a slot left on your Drobo, you could put another drive in. But if all your slots are full, you could get a bigger capacity drive and just pull the old one out, substitute the new one in, and all your data are copied. No matter if you add a drive or, and here's another example, if a drive fails, a light will turn red, you pull out the failed drive, you put a new one in, and all the data are replicated because they're copied across all the drives that you have in your Drobo. So they're expandable, they're data aware, They're redundant, and they're simple to use. Drobo makes a whole family of products. They have eight different products, depending on what your use is. If you have a lot of data that you need to store, if you want portability, they have a Drobo Mini that you can take out in the field. If you need huge amounts of storage, they have up to 12 drive units that you can get. Or if you want network accessible storage, if you want to plug a Drobo into your router or switch and have it accessible Uh, say in the lab or throughout your home, they have a device that'll work with that as well. Next time I'll tell you how you could actually use one of these network attached Drobos and access your data from all around the world in a completely secure fashion. Now, listeners of TWIM can get $100 off on their purchase of a Drobo Mini 5D, 5N, or any 8 or 12 drive system. Just go to drobostore.com and use the discount code Microbe 100. We thank Drobo for their support of TWIM. I have a couple of cool emails I want to read before we wrap up this episode. The first one is from Reed, who writes, Dear Vincent Alio, Michael, and Michelle, I've just 
recently finished TWIM number 133 and wanted to comment about the use of the term secondary metabolite throughout the episode and often in the primary literature. Michael pointed out that a secondary metabolite is a molecule that is produced by an organism as it reaches stationary phase. This is actually one of several characteristics that are used to define what a secondary metabolite is. Other common features are that secondary metabolites are, quote, small, unquote, molecular weight compounds. They are not involved in the normal growth of an organism and that they are dispensable for growth and fitness of the producing organism. However, while many of these molecules are non-essential under laboratory conditions, they may be critical for survival under natural conditions. For example, siderophores are critical for scavenging iron under iron-replete conditions. Iocyanins produced by Pseudomonas aeruginosa are involved in redox homeostasis. Bacillin produced by Bacillus subtilis is essential for defense against lysis caused by Streptomyces species MG1 and predation by Myxococcus xanthus. Lugdunin, highlighted in this episode, is another such case. Additionally, many of these molecules are produced during multiple growth phases and are not exclusively limited to stationary phase. Taken together, these few examples illustrate that secondary metabolites may be far from secondary in their physiological importance. It is for these reasons and more that many have taken to calling these wonderful molecules specialized metabolites. Thank you for the podcast. Wow, that's a great definition, isn't it? Mm. Then we have to change the name. <laughs> oh, oh no, horrors to change. <laughs> yes, we, well, mm-hmm. they're they're going to accuse of his, accuse us of being immunologist. That's right, changing the name. But I, I think he's got a good point there. And he d- he has yeah, secondary absolutely. to lab culture. That's right. That's right. And he has a fantastic point. Mother Nature never does anything for no reason. All right. Well, thank you, Reed. That was great. Anthony writes. Uh, Anthony sends us a link to an article in the Washington Post. And it's called, he withered away for seven years. Doctors didn't realize his passion was killing him. This is a man in uh, Manchester, England, who came to the lung disease clinic, April, 2014. He was 61 years old. And over the previous seven years, he was finding it harder and harder to breathe. He used to be able to run 10 kilometers. He couldn't walk 20 meters anymore. His lungs were operating at a third of their capacity. Uh, Doctors were stumped. But it turned out he played the bagpipes. They had doctors had overlooked his daily hobby, playing the bagpipes, and they got them and they looked what was in them. And it turned out there was a slew of fungi and yeast living <laughs> inside Ooh. of the oh instrument. A mixture of Pacillomyces variotti, Fusarium, Rhodotorula, and Penicillium species. And then wow. they could finally treat him. Wow. <laughs> so the well, more of that spit more of the, yeah, I guess. Right. And then yeah, it's, it's not all surprising, it's, right? Yeah. It's not all at all surprising. Uh, a very interesting story. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, and one more from Henrik. Hello. Thanks for providing so much information. I have a mast cell activation syndrome and recently was seen by professor, Dr. De Meyerlier in Brussels to look for chronic infections as a possible cause. He found that I have positive serology for tularemia. So it seems that I was in contact with any of the Francisella organisms. He did some follow-up tests. I will only get to know next month. My question is, can the organism Francisella tularemia, sorry, tularensis, establish chronic infections, or will the host either always die or kill the pathogen completely? Thank you very much. So I went to the expert, Katie Bozio, out in uh, Hamilton, Montana, at the Rocky Mountain Laboratory, sent her his email. And she said, there have been a few reports of chronic infections with tularemia, but I think those were largely restricted to the early days of antibiotic therapy and were symptomatic. They also started with a known exposure to F. tularensis. It sounds as though the listener may be asking if F. tularensis can cause subclinical disease, i.e. infection, without detected signs of illness. There's not much data on this either, but there have been some reports suggesting that it is possible. And Katie provides references for uh, both of those statements of hers. So thank you, Katie, for responding. 
Katie, by the way, was on TWIM some time ago. She's an investigator at Rocky Mountain Laboratories and works on F. tularensis. All right, that episode, this episode of TWIM is going to be, of course, on iTunes, microbe.tv slash TWIM and microbeworld.org. And if you, even if you don't listen on, on iTunes, please go over there and find the show and give us a rating. That way we stay visible to new listeners who will then find it easier to discover the amazing world of microbiology. Consider becoming a patron of TWIM and all the other shows that we produce. You can contribute as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash microbe TV or go to microbe.tv slash contribute for some other options as well. As always, we love getting your questions and comments and explanations for things like secondary metabolites. We do appreciate it. Send them to twim at microbe.tv. Michelle Swanson is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. You have a football game this weekend? We sure do. Colorado's coming into town. And I, I guess you're going, right? I am. Do you have season tickets? I do. Wow. Enjoy. Thank you. <laughs> Alio Schechter is at Small Things Considered. Thank you, Alio. My pleasure. Now you can go have lunch, right? That's right. <laughs> My lunchtime. Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. I hope you don't get any more hurricanes. I do, too. But the season's not over yet, right? Nope, we got, it goes through Thanksgiving. All right, good luck. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. They like to thank, of course, the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Chris Kandian and Ray Ortega for their technical help. I also want to thank the sponsors of this episode, Curiosity Stream and Drobo. The music you hear on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.